So the oceans are dead. Like, that's just what it is. I've become accustomed to the fact that within my lifetime, um, the oceans are going to die. Like, 70% of this planet it will not be able to sustain life as we know it, the oceans of this world. And we're talking about um, Japan dumping the nuclear, the waste from the nuclear cooling pools uh, straight into the ocean, as they're saying they are going to do. Now, as you know, the uh, core from the nuclear meltdown went into the groundwater. I don't believe they've ever, like, actually recovered the core. And so it's been a constant, continuous, ongoing... Um, nuclear disaster and oceanic disaster with just waste spewing constantly into the um, the ocean, the Pacific. And um, Japan, you know, they're, they haven't been recording or reporting um, the findings. Like, the international community doesn't really know the extent of how horrible this disaster is already. And I know, for instance, with um, the normal testing they normally did on rice and for for domestic use and export, they stopped testing it once it became clear that um, rice crops were growing with highly contaminate, um, yeah, contamination. So it's it's a huge disaster. Now they're kind of just kind of shrugging and saying, "Well, we're going to dump the cooling pools straight into the ocean," and horrible it's just horrible like and um in california here we have news that 25,000 barrels of toxic waste has been discovered in the in the pacific outside of los angeles area so and they they think it's ddt is what they're saying but whatever it is it's it's bad so i don't want to i'm not jumping to conclusions when i say like the ocean oceans are dead it's not like you know, when people think the oceans are dying, you think of the large species, you think of the cute dolphins and the whales, like Star Trek IV, when they have to go and get uh, George and Gracie to repopulate whales, which are extinct, but you still have these healthy, vibrant oceans. Um, even without these disasters, oil spills, there's a massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico that's kind of been kept quiet about. Uh, even without these mass massive disasters, uh, we are still on track to having dead oceans, um, largely from, you know, uh, climate change, temperature rise, but on also ocean acidification. So ocean acidification, it, it basically um, lowers the pH levels, it changes the pH level of the ocean water, less oxygen in the water. Um, a huge problem with the oceans is microplastics. So you get these microplastics um, dumping into the ocean, like small little fragments it can affect the um, the the small little creatures that that go up the food chain. So your your planktons and your this and bird life, bird life that which um, you know they dissect these birds that eat ocean small little ocean fish, and these birds are dying because they have plastic in their guts or they get diseases where they can't reproduce. Um, so if you've seen the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch and other of these um, giant islands, continents almost, of just plastic and garbage, um, it's, it's insane, and like, there's like 14 million tons of plastic on the ocean floor, and so what we're seeing is the coral reefs are dying off rapid, rapidly, the um, acidification causes these dead zones, which are ever-expanding, and, you know, when you say it's, see an ocean dead zone, it's an area that just, like, won't support life. Um, think of it like a desert in the ocean or, you know, somewhere where it's just, it, it won't support um, life as we know it in the ocean. Maybe, like, jellyfish, I think, are probably the only creatures that can kind of adapt a little bit to dead zones and stuff. But, um, so we're on track to, like, not only having dead oceans that don't support life, you know, from the from the bottom up, um, we're probably going to see just about every species that lives that relies on the oceans to live just die off rapidly. And we're of course also seeing sea level rise. I don't know; it's going to be like twenty-five to thirty feet 
in our lifetimes. I don't know, maybe not. Some some crazy else. I, I might be off on my number there, but it's going to be pretty um, incredible. And the uh, polar ice caps are melting at a rate much faster than anyone thought. Um, and this is going to create a carbon like as the as the polar ice caps melt, they release carbon that's trapped in there, and it's just going to make the whole process speed up much faster, go a lot faster. Um, that's bad. It's not. It's not. It's not cool at all. And um, all the oceans, people don't know this, are like a carbon sink in themselves. So they like store store carbon in the ocean. Um, but as the ocean warms in temperature, as it becomes more acidic, there's reports that say it might not be quite as effective at capturing storing carbon, and um, it can also like at some point possibly start releasing the carbon it has trapped in there, much like the ice caps are now. So you, you get this cumulative effect of um, where the problems we cause then create more problems. And you have people like Elon Musk who have this like fantasy of like trapping carbon and inventing some machine to like trap carbon. It's kind of like a perpetual motion machine. It's not going to happen. We already know the machines that trap carbon and store carbon and are good for the planet, which are like trees and healthy oceans. So it's, um, you know, stop cutting down trees and making plastic and doing all these things. You know, you'd get oil out of the ground, you make plastic with it to make computers, to try to make machines that will store carbon, where the whole process and the energy you're putting into trying to solve this problem is actually making things worse, whereas we already have the technology to do it. So, like, stop destroying the Amazon, you know? I mean, although I think the oceans are too far gone to, to save, like, we've crossed that threshold already. We've done enough damage, but I think it's still worth trying to save it. Like, let's stop dumping plastic in the ocean. Let's, you know, stop putting burning fossil fuels and... Making matters worse, but I'm not helpful at all, hopeful at all for about our oceans. I do not see anything good, um, any good news on the oceanic front anytime soon. No Star Trek Four kind of happy whale tale of saving the oceans. Uh, then other really kind of cool story I've been watching is this new UFO leak. Um, I was stoked to see this. So, like, we saw this, like, in the Trump administration, the Navy, the government. They started kind of releasing footage, um, leaking footage, and kind of verifying some of this footage. But this one, to me, is cool, this new one here. Um, and what you see here is kind of a triangle, another triangle, and another triangle. And if you look carefully, like when um, you can kind of see that there is like these brighter lights in the corners of these. And this is almost, um, this is very similar to a UFO sighting I had in like the early 90s, which kind of gets me stoked. It was, what I saw was a giant triangle and it kind of morphed into three triangles looking a lot like this one is right here. And then each of those triangles kind of morphed into three white dots. So this is like, oh yeah, this looks very familiar to me. It looks like something I have in my memories from, you know, the early the early 90s. Um, so I was stoked to see this. Like, you know, when they were, the Navy was verifying and the Pentagon was verifying these UFO sightings uh, during the Trump administration, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really know the what for and the why. What's interesting to me is that, okay, it looks like the leaks are starting to continue. Um, the verifications are starting to continue under um, Biden now. So that's telling me that this is kind of, I hate to say deep state, but it's more of like a, it's like, a, it, it, it's in the, in the woven fabric of our government that this is kind of go continuing to move this declassification it seems like worldwide there is that direction of um, we're getting little bits and little bits of the the truth of what our 
governments know and what our powerful people know about UFOs and and learning more. So I'm um, sort of excited about that. I think, yeah, I've, I'm going to keep my eye out for more UFO information. So then we got um, next in the news that I am stoked about is, not stoked about, uh, so uh, Biden gave his kind of state of his State of the Union, he it, it it's not 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 technically his State of the Union, but his stand-in for a State of the Union it was the first time he spoke and addressed um, the, the Congress uh, since he took office, and uh, he covered a lot of stuff. I was um, people are giving him kudos for it, but honestly, like his framing of you know we have to win this century and this and that and he did a lot of like baiting of north korea korea and china and i don't think it's useful to see china as a competitor especially in this environment where i know i was just like talking shit about japan or something but um but that was merely on like their environmental um decision to dump waste into the ocean but uh this baiting of China and this this um, kind of demonizing of China I, on his part, uh, I thought was very disruptive. And like, I don't think I think to face the problems our world is facing, we need to not have competition, but collaboration with our um, with the rest of the world. Um, and it to try to compete economically with China. It's obvious that the U.S., other than the fact that we have military bases covering the planet, which is kind of scary, we are a declining power. And uh, China is gain has a larger sphere of influence that's growing. So it's, you know, we, have, we only should hope that they are better members of the international community as they kind of grow in influence. Um, and I certainly don't think it's health, a good idea to have this kind of competitive um, impulse to think that we can like beat them in any way, not even militarily, like economically, anything like that. So I think we should just like give up the game, say, all right, it's your turn. Um, go for it, but, um, yeah, so I, I, I was not impressed with Biden's speech from that standpoint, from that point of view, wasn't stoked, um, and then, but this came out, the, uh, menthol cigarette ban, and, like, I'm just, like, really, this is, like, kind of ridiculous, like, he earlier said, um, this year that, oh, we don't have time to work on marijuana decriminalization this and that and you know he was the the teetotaler um you know he 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 got his chops in the senate writing anti you know with the drug wars writing um criminalizing um uh you know all sorts of um like the crime bill and uh it, it went a long way to putting millions of people in jail largely disproportionately black and brown people and that was him that was the guy who uh who defended the police beating Rodney King he's all these accusations are are pretty founded of his history of legislating in a racist way and he doesn't have time for decriminalizing marijuana now that a lot of states are and a lot of um the kind of national um, pulse on it is that we should decriminalize it, uh, and that would go a long way to getting people out of prison, getting them re rehabilitated into the world, and making some amends for you know, the atrocities of the drug war, uh, but instead he decides he's going to take up banning menthol cigarettes, and of course this is like sold as, well, we're addressing um, the health and well-being of of you know the black community because they are harmed disproportionately by menthol and menthol flavored cigarettes. I mean, to me that's just like racist at its core. It's a product, and maybe a larger share of that product that's on the market is purchased just happens to be purchased by 
uh, black people, and maybe it's what they prefer. Um, but you care about their health. Like, this is how you're going to go after them by criminalizing a, a flavor, a style of cigarette. And at the same time, like, not, um, you know, no Medicare for all, no, nothing like that to improve, give more people access to health care or to something they can afford. Um, and, you know, for me, it's universal coverage, cradle to grave, uh, Medicare for all is the policy. That's the gold standard. But nothing to address the people's health, access to health care. Nothing to address the in, the decades of inequality and injustice in the um, in the in the you know prison industrial complex and our 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 corrupt um, judicial system. And policing, you know, which disproportionately targeted black people and put them in jail. I mean, this guy Biden, his son, was a was a avid crack cocaine user, among other things. And he gets he's on a book tour, um, and he gets all this extended all the sympathy in the um, in the world. But people are still sitting in jail from Biden's policies, and now he just wants to you know smack the menthol cigarette out of their mouth. I think it's um, de kind of despicable and uh, stupid and a waste of time. And honestly, I feel like it's a, um, this is a fight he chose to put out there because it'll draw into contrast the stark differences between Republicans and Democrats, which really there aren't many. But this is one of those issues like the soda issue, soda ban issue a few years ago from New York. It'll get um, a lot of clicks, a lot of, get people riled up. And by the way, I think this is also why he chose to push, rather than push universal health care, $15 minimum wage, he chose to push um, um, universal uh, access to child care. Because I think Republicans, he's kind of setting up the Republicans for a fight they want to have in the culture wars. Because if you say, um, I'm going to work on a $15 minimum wage or I'm going to work on universal health care. The Republicans have to oppose you just because that's how the game is played and what the media expects and all this. But that's not a fight the Republicans want to have because the Republican base actually supports Medicare for all and the Republican base, that's the voters, they support um, uh, $15 minimum wage. So the Republicans don't want to have that fight out in the open because they're they're going to lose a lot of their base who are like, well, actually, I do want those things. But a fight they don't mind having is universal child care because they can come out there and say, oh, the, the nanny state wants to take your kids even younger than they already are and indoctrinate them to the liberal agenda. So I feel like when the Democrats propose universal child care, they're being disingenuous. I think the script's already written. Like, there's probably been some discussions um, in in the back rooms of, okay, we're gonna put this put this out there, and this is kind of where we're gonna put our energy for two years. We're gonna uh, the Republicans will fight against it, um, and it'll be the Democrats will be able to say, hey, we tried to get y'all universal child care, universal health care. Um, and the Republican, but, you know, the Republicans fought us the whole way, and the Republicans will be able to say, you know, pick that fight and fight against it and not lose too many of their base. They're, a, lot of their, a lot of their base will um, be in agreement that they're not for the universal child care. I mean, many of them will be. A lot of Republicans have kids and would love to get some, some free um, nanny state daycare, but... Uh, but that that's where I'm at on that. I don't think it's a genuine position by the Democrats. I don't think we're going to get universal child care. Um, and but but I think it's a fight that we're going to be seeing a lot of the oxygen in the room is going to be wasted on this issue for the next uh, couple years. Yeah, record review. Why not? So my favorite band, Guided by Voices, of course. You know me. I talk about them a lot. 
kind of like I gave up on listening to mu new music, but this is like the one band who I'll follow and get all their all their music. So Earthman Blues just came out. I, I got it a few weeks ago. If you order vinyl from Rockathon, they tend to send the records out a couple weeks before the release date, but this officially just released. And I gotta say, great record, amazing record. Um, it's this the this current lineup has been pumping out like three records a year, like four records if you count like the Cash Rivers albums and kind of offshoot things like that. Um, but what what's interesting is that like it started with Rolling Stone, they gave it a four star kind of stellar review, and then after that the um, reviews started coming from everywhere else and the common thing people are saying is oh this is their best record in decades or this is their, the best record in 10 years and uh best record since the classic era and it's just like uh, uh this current lineup what they they put out uh, i don't know which where this falls but this is like the eighth or ninth or tenth out yeah eighth or ninth i'd say of the this current lineup and um not my favorite of it all. It's a really, really good record, but it's not. It's not the. For me, it's like four or five. It's not the best at all of like, um, the present lineup. Like I would put Warp and Woof ahead of it. I would put um, uh, Space Gun ahead of it. I would put um, Sweating the Plague ahead of it. So this is kind of sitting in that zone um, where it's kind of probably tied or close to like Zeppelin over China or August by Cake and one of those one of those records. So it's an, it's weird to me that uh this is the one that kind of is capturing the attention of the um reviewers and the critics and stuff, but it's a great record. I will, don't get me wrong. So my favorite song by far is How Can a Plum Be Perfected? It's got kind of that like ethereal uh dreamy quality that I love um uh trust them now and free agents those were the singles those are kind of like solid um power pop fun songs um people t really love this track lights out in memphis and it's pretty cool it's their most prog track on there but it gets a little bit uh repetitive for me i would say the one what people are getting from that song I get from Ant Repellent. Ant Repellent is just like a lot of fun, a little gonzo, a little little heavy and great. And I'm stoked that the best two songs on the record close out the record. Like, How Can a Plum Be Perfected in Child's Play? Child's Play just goes out with like a ton of riffage and just fun. And the record's out like that. And I think that's the best way to go out. Sunshine Girl Hello, really fun pop song. Um, Batman Sees the Ball has like a really cool, cool rhythm. Thirty Kid School, same. They got, they both have like an interesting rhythm to them that you don't really hear this band do a lot. So, this is a solid record. Each track, it's sequenced really well. I think, I think as a record, it works really well, and that's what lends to kind of the accolades it's getting. Whereas some of the songs they've put out on the last four years, I think reach greater heights and have better standout tracks uh but this is a very um uh a consistent record putting it on there's actually like two i would say like i bet hippie and test pilots are like the low point but it comes back really strong with these two songs so it's i don't really love um test pilot and i bet hippie they're not hitting me right now so Whereas some of their earlier records they put out recently, like Warp and Woof and uh, Sweating the Plague and um, Space Gun, I love every song on the record. There's nothing, no, there's no weak spots. Um, but hey, I'm not going to disparage it. I love seeing the mainstream press kind of um, take notice of my favorite group, and I love that people are enjoying this record.